Hello, welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. So politics is a lot like magic. To get people to believe your tricks, you have to get them to look the wrong way at just the right moment. Well, wow, Joe Biden turns out he seems to be great at this game of misdirection, this game of magic. He has progressives scurrying around the top appointments to stop these top appointments that he may or may not even be planning to make. Or like his appointment of Neera Tandon that have no chance of being confirmed in a Republican Senate. Neera Tandon sure looks like a ploy to keep us busy so we aren't pressing Biden on the real big questions. Sure, it matters who he names, but it matters a whole lot more what he plans to do. Certainly, we want a cabinet, uh, members of the cabinet who will fight hard for working people. But even better will be a president who tells his cabinet to fight hard for working people. This is, of course, why I don't want Bernie Sanders or Sarah Nelson for labor secretary. Their independent power to fight for us from the outside will be far greater in the Senate in Bernie's case or as the front of the American labor movement in Sarah Nelson's case. But the Biden team, keeps sucking us into these arguments, distracting us, draining our time and energy away from the real fight. The fight to get the Biden-Harris administration to be the leaders the people need right now, the leaders of this crisis that they are inheriting. Biden said the other day that he feels our difficulties. I'm sure some comms technocrat advised him to say that. Look, we don't care if you feel for us. We don't need a return to the feel our pain Clinton era. I don't care what Biden feels, but what I do want to know, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? I don't care how you feel. What are you going to do to stop the virus, to start the economy, to get people back to work in decent jobs at real wages, livable wages, to keep furloughs from becoming long-term unemployment, to prevent the wave of mass evictions that is about to break over the country to curb corporate power and the role of money in our politics to expand government's responsiveness, not talk about it, and then slash and burn social programs. The last two Democratic presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, tacked to the middle to make compromises with Republicans during economic crises. Those compromises are a big part of why this crisis is so bad. We need a different strategy. Wheeling and dealing with Mitch McConnell isn't going to get us where we need to go. Wheeling and dealing with the progressives and the establishment is not going to get us where we need to go. This is why I refuse to get misdirected into pointless fights over individual appointments. And I'm talking about pointless fights. You all know what I think of Neera Tandon. She does not belong in the government. In her case, I am confident the Republicans will stop her. So the next time I will mention her name is after the Georgia elections. If the Democrats pull off the the double down, the the, the big win that puts them in in control of the Senate, then I will bring Neera Tannen up again to just say to Bernie Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders, who wisely refused to go into the Biden administration, I will say to him that it is up to you to block Neera Tannen as as your budget committee chair role will allow you to do so. In the meantime, we all need to stay focused. Keep our eyes on the prize. Look at the energy we spent fighting to stop Michelle Florney from becoming defense secretary because of her ties to Silicon Valley, only to get General Lloyd J. Austin III, a board member at Raytheon. Don't get me wrong. It is long overdue to have, overdue to have a black defense secretary, especially since 40 3% of our active duty military are soldiers of color. But what matters right now is not the identity of a defense secretary, but what General Austin and President Biden do on defense issues, like breaking open the military industrial complex and reducing the power of weapons manufacturers like Raytheon, who have tremendous power over our full cycle budget. Also, while we are on this topic, General Austin retired four years ago after 41 years as a soldier and one of the most respected battlefield commanders in the military. But there is a law that says you can't be defense secretary until seven years after leaving the military. This is not some technical detail. It is an effort to maintain one of the most fundamental safeguards in our political system, civilian control 
of the military to stop, say, coups from happening. Trump got a waiver for General Mad Dog Mattis. Biden will need one for General Austin. And as progressives, we need a clear statement from the president that this is not the new normal. It is the wrong direction. We need less military industrial influence in the government, not more. That isn't just a progressive policy. It goes to the core of a healthy democracy. Biden can set the policy even if his new defense secretary is a retired general who worked at, at Raytheon. You get it? He can set that policy. It isn't just who they are. It is what they are going to do that really matters. Well, except for Neera Tandon. But I will talk more about her after the Democrats sweep Georgia like General Sherman. We have a great show today. Salvador Tio is back. Uh, he's going to be talking more about Caribbean politics, but specifically colonial uh, politics in the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, of course, their independence. And later we have Chris Halali and Lance from the Surf Sun. So we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Hey guys, while you're here, make sure to smash that like button, click subscribe. Of course, join us in the comments. I know they get lively. I know Professor Harvey K is in there right now. And uh, if you're not already, it's the holiday season. This is a great time to indoctrinate your friends. So for as low as five bucks a month, you can go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show, become patrons, hear our show on podcast, also some special interviews and extras. Uh, there's also swag there, so you can join us at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited about having our friend Salvador Theo back on. Uh, he was on about a month ago, and and from what I heard in the chat, folks thought he was a wizard. I remember that very well. They said, who is this genius wizard? Salvador Theo <laughs> is a civil rights attorney. Uh, he is the former head of the New York ACLU. He is an independence activist on the island of Puerto Rico. And uh, we just had so much to talk about last time. So we're just going to pick up. I mean, this is like basically how Salvador and I talk anyways. We just sit there for hours, sometimes with a little, um, what did we have last time? It was, a, it was, it was the barlito, right? The, the rum, oh, or, or you had Cuban rum. That was very good. I think it was Cuban rum we had then. Yeah, you had uh, smuggled that, some Cuban rum in, and, and I was going with the local stuff. Barlito, was, if you go there, uh, drink it. Yeah, Four star, right? We have not seen each other since we met in New York the last time. Yes, it's true. You're, you're overdue true. here. Yeah, I'm well overdue. I'm ready to go to the island anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, now that we've caught up on our, on our lives and our drinking habits. <laughs> um, all right, there's this, let's just remind folks, maybe who didn't see the, the, the last time you came on, uh, right after the election, 
you know, during the election, there was a vote once again for statehood, uh, which of course is one of the dividing markers of the, the island's politics and, and the island's party system. Of course, there's the Democrat Republican uh, system in, 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 on the mainland, but on the island itself, there are different party systems, uh, parties, excuse me, that align with the Democrats or the Republicans on the mainland. But it, the Democrats and Republicans don't have much of a, a, a play, at least, in, pol- in, in the politics of the island. And I say that because w- it's the, the parties are aligned around what the future of the island is, what the island should be uh, declared as. Is it an you know, independence movement, statehood, et cetera? So this vote for statehood actually revealed a lot, a growing independence movement, uh, which has been under attack for since, since the US took control of the island. So can you tell us a little bit like what's happening? First off, this a little bit behind the history of the independence movement. Let's start with that because, um, you know, I think for folks who, who who are interested in leftist politics and you know Cuban Revolution, the Global South revolutions, Puerto Rico is a big part of that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that first, like the the history of independence on the island. Well, you, we have to go back to eighteen six to the eighteen sixties. Uh, it was not just. Are you listening to me uh, clearly? Okay. It was not just independence that uh, the people in Puerto Rico were after. They also were seeking to abolish statehood. I mean, uh, uh, slavery. Puerto Rico finally eliminated slavery in 1873. But in 1864, uh, I think marks the, it's before and after 1864, because there was an armed insurrection in Puerto Rico against Spain. And it was defeated after two days. But it marked, I mean, from then on, anybody who was for independence could be, could be sent, uh, could be hung, could be hanged. Uh, It was impossible to remain in Puerto Rico and be actively involved in the movement for independence. Betances, who was the main leader of this uprising, was living in Paris. He was a doctor. Uh, very close and also, but in addition to being in Paris, spearheading the independence movement from there, he was also the delegate early on and later on also of the Cuban struggle for independence. And because this is just, I, just to be clear, this is still under Spanish rule because it wasn't until later. It is. In the century. It is. Uh, Puerto Rico yes. was in Spanish rule until 1898. Exactly when there was the invasion on the 25th of July, which is also the date of the constitution that was adopted in 1952, the 25th of July, and also the date of the 25th uh, of July in in 1978, when the two Puerto Ricans were assassinated by the police in what was really uh, a montage directed by an undercover agent of the police who took them to ostensibly blow up some communication towers in Cerro Maravilla that time. But it was really something orchestrated from the the governor's house, from Carlos Romero Barcelo himself. Why? Well, he wanted to let... But this is is in the 70s. So wait, let's backtrack a little bit. (laughs) 1870s. 1870s. Okay, so the... 1860s. Well, no, this is in the 70s later on. The three... The three... Yes. The three, well, the exactly. independence movement became more, what became the mainstream then was the autonomous movement. It was seeking to establish some kind of relationship with Spain, which would have enabled Puerto Ricans to have, let's say, representation in the um, Congress there. Las Cortes de Cadiz was the name, it, because it was in the city of Cadiz that they were being held. Uh, but it would still be part of the I don't know if we could call it an empire anymore because all that Spain had left was Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The three significant possessions. I explained in our last interview why they decided to keep Puerto Rico. So immediately after 1898, you have a split. You have on the one hand, uh, the what what was the Liberal Party or the Autonomous Party, had been the Autonomous Party and later became El Partido Liberal, the Liberal Party, 
o el partido Unión de Puerto Rico, the Union Party. And that basically had people who were for independence in it, but who were dealing predominantly with what kind of a relationship could be established with the United States. Now, the United States decided to extend citizenship to Puerto Rico in 1917. Why? Well, the war. It wanted, they didn't want to recruit as many Puerto Ricans there for the army then. What they wanted to be able to say was that this was U.S. territory, that these were American citizens, and that any intervention by the Germans, let's say, right. in the Caribbean would be met as a hostile act against the United States. And it was geopolitically, uh, as you talked about in was, the last, there was a, the, the, yes, it was geopolitically advantageous, the Panama, it was a kind of a block to the Panama Canal. Right. Was, right. right. Word. And, and it continued, well, it, The Panama Canal continues to be important. Obviously, not ha doesn't have the same relevance, perhaps, as it did have at one particular point in time, particularly then in the 40s. Because in, in 1934, the independence movement uh, receives uh, Don Pedro Alviso Campos is in Puerto Rico since 1929, 1930. He becomes. And, and who is he? Is he is the icon? The he is the Che Guevara, party. right? Whoop, Salvador, you froze a little bit. Dorsey, is he good on your end? You might just hold for a second to make sure that we Listen. have a good connection. There we go. You're back. You, you froze well, for a I'm second. Back. So Pedro Albizo Campos uh, Pedro was the independence. He's the icon of, of the independence movement in, in Puerto Rico. He's like he, the Che Guevara of he's, he big Yes, he was an important figure. Uh, but in 1934... In addition, as long as he had just been raising the Puerto Rican flag and talking about independence, I don't think what happened would have happened. But then in 1934, uh, uh, Puerto Rico was essentially a sugarcane field controlled by the, by the Sugar Trust. And the first American civil governor, Charles Allen, had set up Domino Sugar. I mean, they really used Puerto Rico. Domino uh, Sugar, the, the, the company. The big, Domino big Sugar, company. yes, exactly. you know. These were people mostly from New England who decided that they were going to be coming to Puerto Rico to be able to have, and they did have the four largest sugar companies, um, Guanica Central, which is where the Marines entered to in, 18, in 1898 when they invaded Puerto Rico, Aguirre, which is also in the south with Guayama, they had Eastern Sugar in Fajardo, They had, they had four large ones and then several other Puerto Rican sugarcane mills, but they basically controlled the price and they paid a sugarcane worker 70 cents a day for working 10, 11 hours in the field under the sun with half an hour for a break for lunch. Uh, and, and women were paid about 35 cents a day to do piecework doing sewing on the island. The, as, in addition to the Independence Party or the Autonomist Party, there was also a statehood party called El Partido Republicano. Partido Republicano, founded by a doctor from Puerto Rico who had studied in the, in the Midwest, and he was for statehood. He was a black man. Uh, many people who were black veered towards statehood because they saw maybe these white people from Spain being inimical to them, and they felt or thought that maybe within the context of the United States, well, it was not really true, because obviously, although there is always racial differences and problems in any society, in more, since Puerto Rico has less, significantly less. Why? Well, we're mixed. There is no such clear division between black and white in Puerto Rico. There's a phrase called el que no tiene mandinga, el que no tiene dinga, tiene mandinga. He doesn't have, if you don't have dinga, you have mandinga. We all have some presence of African and Native American Taino blood. Taino Indians, right. And, and genetic. We also have much more genetic, genetics from the Native Americans in Puerto Rico, the Taino Indians, than it is normally thought. But that's another issue that we're not going to get into right now. Next thing is that, <laughs> the thing is that the statehood movement wins the elections from 1932 to 1940. But it was a 
coalition. It's what it was called, in fact, La Coalición. And it had the Socialist Party. But a Socialist Party supported by the AFL-CIO and Gompers. It was pro-statehood. And of course, the, the other pro-statehood peoples, many of which also had interest in the sugar cane business, but they were not, they, they, what happened? The workers in the cane felt betrayed by the members who had been then designated to positions in government, ostensibly labor relations positions, and they did nothing for them. Who do they go to? Pedro Albizu Campos. He accepts them and he helps them organize the sugar cane strike of 1934, which did stop sugar cane production for a significant amount of time and really threatened the main economic interests in Puerto Rico. What happens? They sent Colonel Riggs. Colonel Riggs had just participated in the assassination of Sandino in Nicaragua, was very close friend with Governor Winship, who was the governor of Puerto Rico at that point in time. And they start by orchestrating the Ponce massacre. They fired directly Ponce, against the city, right? Okay. The city. People were marching peacefully. They had rifles, but wooden rifles, nothing to shoot with. But they were marching in, in military form as they used to use white pants and a black shirt. Don Pedro wanted people to wear the black shirts because you had to be serious about this. This was serious stuff that you were doing. And they fired on, on the crowd. Uh, they fired on the crowd and uh, it, was, it was not... They, it, was East, they, it was Easter day, right? It, it was it, Easter. So there was another no, reason why they were wearing white. If I, I think it was close to Easter day. I, 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 I forget the exact Because there were day. families there. It wasn't just... There were families. There were several kids. people killed. Kids. Uh, some people wrote, leave a Puerto Rico libre, leave Puerto Rico with their blood on the walls. It was a very dramatic affair. But the, the press in Puerto Rico whitewashed it. It was not until the ACLU and one of its main persons there to get supported also uh, by, um, by the original founder of the ACLU, who then did some hearings in Puerto Rico, and they were the ones who called it the Ponce Massacre. Because otherwise it would never have gone up. What happens immediately? Two independentista guys go in and shoot uh, Colonel Riggs in Old San Juan. Then they shoot them both without any hearing or anything in the, in the, um, in the police station. Two years later, Don Pedro Albizu Campos is in jail. And what why, year was this? Let's, let's just to 34 to 36. It's 34 to 36. Why, okay. why, why does he go to jail? Well, he's accused of, of seditious conspiracy. Well, I call it the impossible crime. If you're a colony. Because if you're a colony, you obviously have an inalienable right to fight for your self-determination and independence. The United States is one of the first nations on the face of this earth who really fully exercised that right, although partially in the sense that the black people were not included. That's how we got the electoral college system so that they would sign the constitution because they had a large population, but they didn't get to vote. And they wanted to have that power that they in fact still have. Because even though the Trump lost the election handily, he still is claiming that he didn't lose it. I mean, he's still right. So, the, they criminalized the independence movement and Don Pedro is sent for 11 years to jail. He's first found not guilty in the sense it's a hung jury by a jury of Puerto Ricans at the federal court. Then they have a second, hear a second hearing and it's uh, only Americans who found him find him guilty and he goes for it and he is subject to a lot Americans of meaning because because what US folks realize is the US imported people <laughs> onto the island well, yeah, because to, in Puerto to make Rico, up the government yeah in Puerto Rico you anybody would say el americano not referring to himself of course he refers to el americano yes at uh, the american but the US i mean specifically well, non-puerto rican they refer really to a US citizen to to somebody from the United States yeah. who lives in Puerto Rico and speaks speak English but that just tells you something. He, the Puerto Rican does not identify himself with that. 
he sees it correctly as something different. Why? Well, you came too late. In 1898, Puerto Rico was already a nation. Uh, and it would have been able to, and it had a significant and very significant capacity in music, in literature, in poetry, in the theater. Uh, it was really a blossoming, uh, in many ways, society. And that continued in the 20th century in spite of the fact that the sugar cane was really, the, it impoverished the Puerto Rican people. So what do you do then in that context? During from 32 to 40, it is, it is Pedro Abizo Campos is in jail at this it's point. It's in jail. Yeah, the leader is, of the movement is is out. Yeah, and but what's then, interesting, but wait, but, yeah. Salvador, what's interesting about this time is this is this is you know obviously American imperialism has been going on for for a very long time, but this is an an odd time because we're we're not yet into World War II. Um, geopolitics is very much focused on 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 the global uh, fight, right? I'm, I'm simplifying this as much as possible. You're not yet in, in World War II, but they knew it was coming. Yes, they knew it was coming. And they so had to prepare like this, for it. Yeah. But it's yeah. amazing because, uh, of course, there were colonial interests in, all over all over the world. But this, this was like the first, as far as I read, the first real aggressive, aggressive intervention against any sort of leftist movements in La- Latin America in, in, in the, th- I mean, it wasn't, we're not talking about the fifties. We're not talking, this is pre-CIA. Let's just put it that way. This is pre-CIA. That's the best well, way Well, in Nicaragua, they had done a similar job. Ah, right, right. In Nicaragua. Okay. And they had also invaded the Dominican Republic and Cuba several times. Uh, but in Cuba, Massacre. FDR, FDR yeah. was the one behind the coup in the thirties where Batista became the dictator. And Batista was FDR's guy. It was the so, Democrats. It was the Democrats who instituted and tried to promote the and Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. Perez Jimenez in later on in the 40s in Venezuela. The Somoza family. The 1953 invasion of um, of Guatemala. Bitter fruit, a very good book. But this Written. is this is the 30s. Okay, so Pedro. Oh, yeah, I, that's just the to focus. 30s. Um, now, what happens to the independence movement? Muñoz right. Marin forms at the end of the 30s an organization called Acción Social Independentista, Social Action for Independence. So Muñoz Marin, who becomes really uh, the head of what later uh, goes into the Liberal Party, that be, but then forms the new pro, uh, the Popular Democratic Party in 1904 and goes to the elections in 1940. And you didn't vote for governor uh, then. The governor was designated by the United States. But he's able to edge out by one vote that somebody else lends him the control of the Senate. And then there's Rexford. uh, And then the New Deal. Munoz had been a person very closely aligned with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, Muna Lee, whom he was uh, married to, he was very close to the United States and had, in fact, represented with Muna Lee in the United States in a couple of conferences, one in Mexico and another one in Cuba, about what was going to be happening with Latin America. But obviously, Muñoz was already, yes, representing, it was really representing the United States. He wasn't representing Puerto Rico. His wife was the main person, and he was supposedly the translator. But he really was the main guy. He was sort of a, he really was a very powerful politician. Right? So he wins the, he doesn't win the election, but he wins the Senate. And in 1944, he's talking about independence. He's saying right. independence is just around the corner. He says, la independencia está la vuelta de la esquina. That was his slogan. Later on, he begins recalling from that uh, in the con. Be- why? Well, because it's clear that independence is not in the works. It's not. So they start working with what ultimately was to become Commonwealth status, which is in Spanish called Estado Libre Asociado. Three lies in one phrase, because we're not a state in the sense of being an independent Estado, state. state. Yes. Uh, we're not free yeah. and we're not really associated. Yeah. You do not. It's not an association. It is dominion, colonial dominion, in, in by virtue of the 
of the territorial clause, which creates this notion that some states are incorporated because they are going to become states, and some states are unincorporated because they will not become states. So they realized from very early on that you couldn't swallow this, that it was like injecting blood of a different type on a, on a, on a, on a patient. It doesn't work. And even after 122 years, they, they think they won because they had 51 something, almost 52%. Right. That's a loss. Salvador, we have four minutes left. I'm so sorry. <laughs> can yeah. we can we move towards so so to uh, now? Albizo, oh no no no! I mean really because I think we talked about the the sort of moment we're in right now, but uh, I, folks needed to understand. I've got a lot of questions about well, Albizo the, the was came, came out of jail. He came out of jail, right? Yeah, in '47, he sent he spent they they bombarded him with X-rays and and with radioactivity. In the jail, said, this is insane. In the jail in they, Puerto Rico, out, right and outside. There. Right. It's they, a tourist attraction now, by the way, people. Right, you can yeah. go there. It's crazy. Uh, now, so he, they really did a damage to him. Not just uh, him, but lots of leftist leaders. A, a, a lot of, but he, they yeah. really concentrated on him because he was obviously a very significant leader. But of course, Munoz also sort of represented himself for independence. Then they go to the elections in 44 and they win big. The independence people who were in the Popular Democratic Party, and there was a significant membership of independentistas in the Popular Democratic Party, realized that they have been betrayed by Munoz. And they formed the Independence Party, which is the one that now, again, sort of, I mean, the candidate for governor obtained almost 15% of the vote. That's a lot more than we had been obtaining in the last 40 years, 50 years. Big, why? Well, it became illegal to be for independence. People were, the Smith Act from the state, it's called here La Ley de la Mordaza, the gag law, because it, some people went to jail because they organized a banquet to raise funds for the defense of one of them. You go to jail. It was, you were not supposed to have a Puerto Rican flag. I remember in the 60s, when I went to college here, to University of Puerto Rico, 64, Police would stop you because you had a, and they gave you a hard time because you had a Puerto Rican flag in the in the, in your car or in your vehicle. Uh, those things do not erase themselves immediately; they remain. What happened in Maravilla with Romero was that Romero wanted to convince the United States that he was the only one against terrorists, and since there was no terrorism, he had to invent one. I mean, I don't think it's ever reason to blow up communication towers. They didn't. They weren't killing people. Meaning the, the, the people who, the two people. The who people, yeah. But it was sponsored arrested. by the state. Exactly. The, it was. And now, by now the this has all been uncovered. It's been many, many years. But it was uncovered because, yeah. uh, although he was able to edge out a win, by, you know, the machines went out that night, and he was in the back, and then he came out. But he, he stole the election in 1980. That to me is very clear. But he but he didn't win the control of the Senate. Right. And so the Senate started having hearings. I remember I was living in New York in the, in, in the first half of the 80s. I lived in New York. And I, when I came, when I came to Puerto Rico very often because I had a jurisdiction of a legal services program in Puerto Rico. I was regional director in New York before I went to the ACLU. So I saw that you went to, um, to any kind of um, department store where they have TV. No, they sell televisions. Everybody was glued to the TV. I mean, it was like that. Tommy this Muniz, who huge. was the owner of the station, took over. Uh, later, they never, Romero never forgave him. He lost ultimately the TV channel later on. That cost him wow. that. Salvador, I hate to do that. We have this to leave. So interesting. We have Let to me leave. tell but you that's something. Okay, One day, I'd like to leave you with, I'd like to leave you with something that relates to the future and what we're all about. Puerto Rico is part of Cuba, is part of the Dominican Republic. Haiti and Jamaica also not too far away. We are the Antilles. We are not willing or we're not able to communicate directly. We cannot come. Everything has to come through Jacksonville, Florida. The biggest agricultural producer in the Caribbean right now is the Dominican Republic. If we want to get something from them and it has to go through there. Uh, if we do theater, if we do movies, we're all impeded 
And it is on purpose. They don't want Cuba and Puerto Rico to have a relationship, and much less with the Dominican Republic included, because that means it is not our territory that we control. So it's in a way a form of balkanizing the Caribbean. Now, we're not just for independence for Puerto Rico. We're also for free relations with the United States, but very particularly friend relations with the people they don't want us to relate to. Who? Well, Mexico, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia. So the movement, our movement, or has, has to look to Latin America, but that is also very difficult right now. Why is it difficult? Well, you know what has happened to, to the people who tried to make some change in Latin America? What happened to Dilma Rousseff? What happened to the guy who was president of, of Brazil? What happened to Chavez? Apparently, he was drugged. He was put. Well, that Chavez is that, now. I thought Chavez controlled our elections. Well, Ch Chavez, I, I don't know. All he, right, on that note. He, he has a very vivid imagination. At, I, at but I mean, Trump has <laughs> a very vivid yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, he flew in. <laughs> <laughs> Literally flew in from <laughs> hell, from, heavens, whatever you believe. No, from uh, Salvador. So, we are, so I have to go. Yeah, you have to go. You have to go. Uh, let's also what see what's it. happening now. Puerto Rican, they just, goodbye. They just, they just <laughs> appointed three more people to the F fiscal control board, which oversees Trump the debt. debt. Just, just so everybody understands. Okay, next time you come on, we'll talk about. Let's talk about the debt. The debt. The debt. We got it. Let's we have go. our topic. Salvador Theo, be well. If I don't talk to you before the holidays, happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah, also. <laughs> all of all the, the holidays. <laughs> all of the holidays for all of the people who use this time of year. This for time of year, for it. exactly. Right. And New Year. All right. Take care. Bye. Salvador <laughs> Theo. <laughs> Always okay. a pleasure. Okay, All right. We will be back after this like very, very, very brief break. Very brief break with Christopher Halali and Lance from the Surfs talking about the Biden uh, foreign policy agenda. We'll be right back. Hey, can everyone hear me? Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikeyshow.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers. I, I don't know why you can't hear her audio. I'm trying to figure it out really quickly. Hold on. Welcome back. Nope. Are we good? Are we having an audio issue? We're good. Oh, sorry. Okay. I am on my end, but I'm just trying to figure it out. Uh, we are live, so you know. <laughs> Lance. <laughs> okay, sorry. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, really excited to have our next guests on. Uh, Christopher Halali was most recently a candidate for Congress in Vermont, uh, the at large congressional district in Vermont. That was from uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, his position was the at large member of the Congress. I'm not speaking properly right now, uh, but he was running on the actual as a communist, which is huge in the U S right. Historic. Uh, but also he is the chair of the Vermont progressive party and the orange County committee, as well as the Versher town committee of the VPP. Blah. And so much more. I didn't even tell the kids. It's, that's just in the last year. And Lance, of course, is from the Surfs TV. Big fan. He's a political comedian. He's the host there. Um, you can check it out. Check him out on 
uh, at Twitter at the surfs TV, but also youtube.com slash the surfs TV. We're doing some cross promotion. Thanks guys for joining us. All Thank right. <laughs> yeah. So, absolute pleasure to be here. I love how everyone's got professional setups. It's, it's beautiful. Um, this is insane. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying my hardest to really compose myself, but it's clearly not coming out that way. Uh, I've been reading the comments sections. Um, the appointments that Biden has made specifically surrounding foreign policy. And now of course he's appointed uh, somebody to be secretary of defense, who I just talked about at the beginning. Uh, I, I, I want to start with the appointment of the defense secretary uh, Lloyd, uh, potential defense secretary Lloyd Austin. Uh, Lloyd Austin is a retired general and a board member of Raytheon, which of course is a major defense supplier, which provided bombs uh, that devastated Yemen and the Saudi war, many, 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 many other places as well. Um, let's start with Chris. Chris, what is your, <laughs> your take on this? I mean, I know what your take is on this. But... <laughs> uh uh, it's not surprising, uh, especially after uh, Flournoy and 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 now we have General Austin, who, by the way, was the head of uh, U.S. Central Command, which is in charge of uh, Middle East, North Africa, that entire region, um, and specifically was in charge of the arming of the quote unquote moderate rebels who turned out to be the alphabet suit of Wahhabi jihadist, uh, you know, groups and Salafist groups from Al Qaeda, Nusra, you know, ISIS. Um, and as someone who fought in Syria, uh, I can tell you that uh, the, the U.S. was uh, on the other side as well uh, in that equation. So it was on all sides. And so now we have uh, a pick uh, in General Austin, who is just um, the same old, same old, the, the revolving door that's classic uh, of the military industrial complex. And uh, really, it's no surprise to me. Uh, and it's no surprise to the leftists and the progressives who were saying from the beginning that uh, you can't push Biden left and that Biden will throw out um, the progressives once he gets into power. And it shows that uh, nothing is pushing him left uh, at all. In fact, he's moving further to the right uh, in many regards with these picks. Well, and specifically this pick, which we talked about at the top of the show, um, he needs to get a, a uh, th- th- there's a law that you're, if you're a former military officer, you have to take seven years there's that break, that pause, but of mm-hmm. course he has to get this cleared uh, because this is supposed to be a civilian position. Uh, Lance, <laughs> just jumping off of Chris's point. All right, great. We can't push Biden left. I understand that. But was there ever, how do you push Biden or any president or any, uh, I mean, even Bernie Sanders, if he were to become president, how would you push them left when it comes to defense secretary? I mean, it's not like Bernie Sanders would eliminate the defense department. Yeah, I, I love how you introduced me as a political comedian. And the first topic you're talking about is bombing children in Yemen. And it's like, all right, now be funny, funny guy. <laughs> See, you did it though. You did it. You just did it. <laughs> um, I Okay, so if everyone doesn't know, I'm a Canadian. And I think y'all are experiencing the same thing we did with Justin Trudeau when he first came in. When Justin Trudeau first came in, he had this amazing multicultural cabinet filled with women, uh, filled with, you know, uh, different minorities in Canada. And at first it was a beautiful thing. All of us were like, wow, real change. This is it. Progress. It's happening. And the same uh, thing seems to be happening with the Joe Biden candidate. Uh, sorry, his cabinet. They're saying that, well, it's great. We finally have uh, a black uh, you know, person in charge of the military. We have, uh, what, half women cabinets in some other positions. These are wonderful. But when you actually break it down and look at what these individuals are doing or want to do, it becomes a lot more horrifying. And in the case of this, yes, this is just uh, another example of basically the military industrial complex uh, reaffirming that they're going to continue to want and uh, demand a lot of taxpayer money in order to continue the war machine going on in the U.S. I have to say that this is not what Jesse Jackson thought about when he was talking about Rainbow Coalition. This is the Rainbow <laughs> Coalition of war and imperialism, not of oh, peace and socialism. So <laughs> that's a very good take. Um, you know, speaking of our friend Jim Zogby, Dr. Zogby, who who has been one of the biggest advocates for uh, the Democratic Party, uh, pushing back against the right wing Zionist uh, movement in, within the Democratic Party. He just went to the board of the Rainbow Coalition Foundation, was part of that coalition. So um, <laughs> on that note, speaking of um, identity politics, let's, do we have that clip of Neera Tandon uh, and the propaganda? I told you I wasn't going to talk about Neera Tandon, but I'm going to talk about Neera Tandon because I just can't. Dorsey, it's, it should be in the rundown. You should have it up there. Um, there is a clip that's circulating right now of Neera Tandon. Uh, Alex Thompson from Politico has pushed it out. 
just to give a little backstory while we're, we're grabbing that clip. So Neera Tannen, of course, was nominated to be OMB director. She's got to go through Senate hearings, even Republican Senate, clearly not going to get, uh, she's not going to move through. But even a Democratic Senate, it, if Bernie Sanders uh, decides to defend all of his supporters who've been going to bat for him for the last five years, um, who've been smeared, isolated, eliminated, whatever, by the cap machine, the cap industrial complex, it's on him to push back and, and make sure she doesn't get cleared. So they're running a very serious propaganda campaign for Neera Tandon. I, I want to show this clip, but then afterwards, I just want to talk about a few of the people who are backing her up. Let's play that clip real quick. I know from my own experience, when we invest in people, they help the economy grow and they make sure our whole country is stronger. My mom had to raise my brother and I on her own, and she really faced a, a choice, a very hard choice, which is whether to go back to India or stay in the United States. She made the brave choice to stay here and try to get into the middle class. First, we were on welfare, we used food stamps. I remember using vouchers to pay for my lunch. But eventually, after a few years, she got a job at, uh, as a travel agent. She was able to buy her own house. And I really know that I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for those government programs. And that is why I find this an incredible and profound opportunity to work to ensure these programs are delivering opportunity for all Americans, just like they delivered opportunity for me. I know families around okay, the country I can't watch anymore. are worried, <laughs> enough. They're worried about get it. <laughs> Neera Tanden, big advocate for government programs. That's what she's known for. Okay, okay. Doesn't she work for a think tank that wants to erode most government programs? Isn't that her whole <laughs> shtick? Like, what is she saying? That's just like outright lies. This is pure propaganda. I mean, what's, what's really crazy to me about this is this is pushing, this is on Twitter, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think this is necessarily to convince the American people who may not know about her cap background. I think her entire purpose is to instigate anger on the left so that maybe she doesn't pass through and somebody else comes in like Bruce Reed or somebody else who hasn't been mentioned yet. But what Alex Thompson says is like, they're, they have this whole, we're not talking about any of our nominees, like the Biden administration you know, is, is saying that, but they're pushing this out. Who's paying for this? Chris, Christopher <laughs> Sahalali, you have- Stay uh, the Lincoln it, Project. The answer's uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> in the In the words of Neera Tandon, we have a giant deficit. They have a lot of oil. And of course, she goes on to say in that, in that exchange with uh, Fahad Shakir, do we prefer cuts to Head Start or WIC or Medicaid? because we live in deficit politics and that's what is happening and will be happening even more. So her way to repay the gesture of all of those food stamps and help that they got from the government is to go bomb and steal other countries' wealth so that they can pay for those programs here because we're not gonna go after the corporations. We're not gonna go after the military budget. We'll go plunder somebody else's resources, which we already do, but she makes it open. It's naked, it's, it's hard, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's it's gross. It's so it's twisted. Gross. Has she ever addressed those emails, by the way? Has anyone ever said, like, did you mean that this means that you want to bomb a country and get them to pay for it? Is, is that what Stop you were saying? Stop attacking a woman of color, Lance. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop exactly. Exactly. I apologize. I, I apologize. I don't think I, I honestly don't think that she's ever been, her, her feet have never really been held to the fire. I mean, who's going to hold her to the fire uh, on this kind of stuff? Well, it, she's not. She's an apparatus of of protecting these interests. And this Absolutely. is what I, you know, I was on the majority report earlier today and, you know, there's like this, this defense of her. I, 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 I'm sorry. I know her. I know these people. I faced them. They wrote smear articles about me personally. So mm -hmm. I spent like four years trying to figure out where was all this coming from? And then other people, there've been stories written about this, about the, the apparatus to literally suppress the left, keep them silent. But then simultaneously, it's this like idea factory for cuckoo ideas some that are very realistic and 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 funded to prop up the military budget and get every single Democratic lawmaker to vote for it, except for mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. But then others like no one it, that wasn't on the table seizing Libya's oil like that's not even doable. And it just shows you if this person is seriously being considered as OMB director and doesn't understand how we fund even the worst programs in this country or pull from the worst programs in this country, I don't. How is this person supposed to be taken seriously in the Biden? Anything, even if she's not being going to pass, 
The Biden administration needs to be called out for even thinking about putting her in charge of the OMB because she's ill-equipped and, and, and it's like putting me in charge of the OMB. Come on. <laughs> I run a little Twitter factory too. <laughs> <laughs> I, the thing that really made me sad too is that during the campaign, her and Bernie Sanders were butting heads constantly for obvious reasons, right? A lot of what he stands for are things that she's diametrically opposed to. And at the same time, Bernie works so hard for Joe Biden Where's- and Joe Biden's campaign, right? Like, I, I don't understand why they would do like such a massive middle finger in the middle of all this i think chris froze um you know i mean that's that's ultimately the question is i i i don't know i don't know i don't know maybe bernie didn't doesn't understand how toxic it got aside from just him as a target um at the top and maybe a few of his surrogates i don't think they're maybe that's just it is he just doesn't understand because he's running for president how how detailed, how specific, how she had people like Sally Albright and like yeah. Reddit pages set up that would smear anybody who challenged her. And she would fight with everybody, not just Everyone. like public figures, you know? <laughs> no, that's so true. Did they I end up picking Chris anyone from the Bernie Sanders campaign? Oh, sorry. Should we should we move Chris or is there a way to did jiggle? you did you say something? Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's well, I originally was asking, oh no, he's gone now. I was originally he's asking, did back. they Okay. Did they pick anyone from the Bernie Sanders campaign? I know there was a transition team and they said they were going to consult with him, but was there any major appointments for anyone who was considered progressive? Not appointments. On the transition team, there were two people who, um, you know, weren't part of 2016. (laughs) I'll just say that. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, they're perfectly fine people, but, you know, one worked for a party that, you know, even though she worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign and I, I don't, you know, she formerly worked for WFP, which is She's a political director for Bernie. That's fine. But WFP did endorse Warren. And and the other, um, uh, you know, I think the other person supported was Josh Horton, if I'm correct. I don't want to mess that up. But um, but yeah, there are a lot of folks that could have could have gone in there, even if there were only two voices in that transition team that, that could have really like lit a flame. <laughs> 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 called him out. Um, all right. While we're waiting, hopefully Chris will come back right now. Sometimes this is, this happens. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of Bernie Sanders, Bernie there, we have a clip of Bernie Sanders, uh, talking about his refusal to vote for the COVID relief bill because it does not include direct payments. Um, can we play that clip really quick? There's a Vermont Senator Sanders. Uh, what's your response to those comments by Senator Warner? I have great concerns, and I share those concerns with the AFL-CIO and hundreds of organizations who understand that right now workers around this country, especially in meat processing uh, plants, have been treated absolutely shamefully. Uh, Amazon, I think, workers in Amazon have developed some 20,000 cases of COVID. We don't know how many have died. What we need to do is to tell corporations that they have got to treat their workers in a way that is safe and healthy. They cannot be irresponsible. And if they're, uh, they are irresponsible, there are going to be consequences. And if we go forward and we grant this type of immunity, what corporations are going to say all over the country is, we don't have to do anything for our workers. They can't do anything to us. So you're giving a green light for irresponsible behavior. That's something I don't want to see happen. Uh, But in addition to that, Jake, I have real concerns about this bill or this proposal, which we have not quite seen yet, to be honest with you, uh, because it does not address the economic crisis facing tens of millions of families in this country. Uh, We are right now in the worst economic shape since the Great Depression. And this proposal does not include that $1,200 direct payment per individual and $500 for kids uh, that we desperately need in order to put working families back on their feet. It would be a real help. We don't have it. I'm going to fight to see that we get that included. Yeah, it's not included in in that compromise proposal right now. Uh, I understand that you spoke with Republican Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri over the weekend. He is also saying uh, that he wants that included and thinks the bill should be vetoed if it doesn't include it. Um, I wasn't aware that Josh Hawley was in favor of direct payments. Uh, Are there enough Republicans uh, on your side on this, on the direct payment part of this, uh, that it could make a difference? Because obviously Republicans still control the U.S. Senate. Well, that's what we're working on right now. And uh, right now I'm working with my Democratic colleagues uh, to make it clear uh, that we should not go forward unless we do what the American... All right, let's, let's... Um, I just want to sort of update that because, uh, you know, this is, I thought this was a really interesting um, pushback, but it's in the last hour, 
The White House asked, uh, the Trump White House, of course, asked Senate GOP leadership to include a second round of stimulus payments, but at $600, not $1,200, an emergency relief package comes so amidst is that, is that part? Sorry, is that, is that part of unemployment insurance or is that just everyone gets $600? Great question. Uh, it seems like it's a stimulus. This, this just pushed out uh, since I've been out in air. So if we have any updates on that, um, feel free to to chime in or see if anybody sees anything. Um, yeah, it's 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 it, more than 100 million Americans will receive it. So I, it seems like, yeah, I don't think it's just unemployment. I think it's uh, more similar to to the the, the payment. Uh, uh, maybe if it's you're under making a certain amount, I don't know. I have to look at the details. But um, but it is in response to this specific kind of alignment between Josh Hawley and and Senator Bernie Sanders, which is. It's, it's, I mean, I'm concerned about it, to be honest. It doesn't mean that you can't have bipartisanship in the White House. I think that's always, a, or in the White House, in the Senate, I th- yeah. and, and in Congress, that's always existed. You know, Bernie Sanders has teamed up with Ron Paul and, and uh, Rand Paul, sorry. But, um, and listen, AOC has teamed up with, with, with Ted Cruz before, even though they fight on Twitter all the time. True. I, I, I'm concerned specifically about this realignment, though, because I do think that there is an active effort by younger conservative lawmakers to, to recognize that they need a base that is not reflective of the base that exists today, meaning to grow their political careers. And so they have to they have to move populist on some issues, especially if they're not necessarily the ones that, you know, they're not senators yet or 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 they may be huge. Do post for all we know. <laughs> but um, are you are you suggesting that this is coming in the form of this uh, stimulus? Like, is, yeah. is that a, yeah. a way to win that? Oh, okay. I mean, if, uh, I think it's very it's very smart politics on Josh Hawley's part. Very true, smart. true. Uh, well, I mean, to me, it's been breaking my heart to watch what has happened in the U.S. with the stimulus bills in general. Because in Canada, we got what was called the CERB, which was a two thousand dollars similar to like a UBI program to anyone who's either couldn't work or didn't work. They just no questions asked. You would log onto a website, hit a couple buttons, and that two thousand dollars a month goes right into your account. And the idea was that after that happens, they'll retroactively look at whether or not you actually were applicable for it. But at the time, it's an emergency. It's a pandemic. We want to lock the country down. Here you go. $2,000. That's not enough for people to live off. Like $2,000, some people, that's, you know, rent, food, all that. But at least it was something. And then I saw what happened in the U.S., like comparatively the richest country in the world, right? All of a sudden got a one-time $1,200 check. That's nothing. Like, I don't know how people are expected to live off that, pay rent, feed families, do any of that kind of stuff. And then the politics would happen back and forth between Pelosi and the other people where it's like, well, we're not going to do this one, but we are going to give billions of dollars of subsidies to the corporations. Well, we might do this one, but we're going to expand unemployment insurance, but still with more billions of dollars of subsidies to these corporations. And then some corporations of which everyone, I think at this point can agree, we don't need anymore, like cruise lines and, and stuff like that, right? Um, so I don't know if, if this is going to be the final stimulus bill that finally helps people in the U.S., it, to me, I, maybe you can give me more insight. It always seems like it's seems like it's just getting worse rather than getting better anytime yeah. soon. Yeah, I think I think what's concerning about this is is not just that um, it's not going to be adequate. And thanks, after like eight months of not having any sort of stimulus, um, I think what's concerning to me about this is that it's happening right before Biden, uh, the Biden administration takes hold, and and that mm-hmm. might be his buff. I mean, he. I don't think Biden's going to come out and say. I think they'll distract. They'll talk about other things like they normally do. And Trump will be able to go to the inauguration, have a rally and say like, look at all your, put your checks up. See my name. That's me. That's me. I gave you that check. And then Biden's going to distract and they're not going to pass anything until like March. And so basically for an entire year, Americans are going to get like 2,800 bucks. You know, congratulations. Um, You've all been evicted from your homes. Uh, and even, you know, even if you weren't evicted, you, you, why would you pay the rent that you were paying a year ago when, uh, the, the, the housing market is shifting so much. Chris, uh, Christopher Hawley was back. Thank you for <laughs> your patience. Um, we were just talking about this stimulus bill. Uh, first off the one that is being presented in the last hour that, 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 that president uh, Trump is saying that he would like stimulus payments to be sent out at $600, not $1,200, um, and that's in response by uh, Senator Hawley and Sanders. Yeah, we, we knew that the, the Trump administration was interested in the $600 figure, and they had floated that uh, in the weeks uh, previous. So this is nothing new. And of course, um, all of a sudden, they've become concerned about the budget now that they've uh, you know run up the deficit and now that they've spent all this money on war and all these corporate tax breaks. Now, as they're leaving office, they're going to start playing the game where, oh, we have too big of a deficit. And they're going to start cutting, not the military, not corporations. They're going to start going after all of the important programs 
like uh, Medicaid and Medicare and all the social security. They're going to go after food stamps. They're going to start saying the language of welfare queens again. That's just a classic, uh, classic move. And so we're seeing it now that they're just going to give out some, you know, uh, some bread to the to the peasants and uh, see if that if if that holds. But I'm really I think we have to be equally enraged at uh, at, uh, you know, the, the so-called progressive wing of the party, which hasn't given uh, a, a much of a fight against Nancy Pelosi and her leadership. I mean, there should have been it, there should have been an uproar here. And uh, I just haven't seen it as much. I see a lot of uh, posturing, but I don't see a lot of a fight. And I need a, we need a fight. I mean, it's I, it's I, just, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what happens is you have a few voices out there. We're talking about the majority report today, and I've been incredibly frustrated by this, where you have reporters who are representing that the left is not pushing back on some things or is more concerned about Rahm Emanuel when their idea of the left is people who send them press releases and who they have on speed dial who are, frankly, Washington insiders who work left-leaning operatives. Great. They have our politics, but they still work in institutions that depend on funding from who knows whom. It could be anything from small dollar donations to to, you know, unions to uh, big donors. But they're not representative of American working class. These are electoral based organizations who in electoral season. Great. Find those coalitions. But these reporters are saying, like, well, the left isn't pushing on this and the left isn't pushing on that. And I'm more concerned with where are the unions on this? If there is a pressure point in any of this right now, it is by using unions, not electoral private organizations to push Nancy Pelosi. And that is what I'm concerned about is where are the unions when you have frontline workers and industries being wrecked and majority, by the way, are not just working class, but poor women of color. You want uh, absolutely. To talk about identity. <laughs> absolutely. And I think that uh, one of the biggest problems and the crises, I think uh, the, the, the many, but also the main crisis of uh, labor uh, organizing and sort of the labor movement in the U.S. is the fact that uh, all of the labor unions that still exist from the Teamsters to all of the government unions and so on and so forth, they're all business unions. They all have, uh, you know, a, a seat at the table with management. They don't necessarily represent the interests of the workers. They try to cut deals to ensure that the union as, as a structure and a bureaucracy can maintain itself instead of going out there on a limb to start fighting. And that's why, you know, you see, for example, I'm sure we'll discuss uh, maybe if we have time, the student uh, strikes, you know, unionization by grad students, uh, you know, uh, tuition strikes. Uh, and you're seeing uh, strikes from below, wildcat strikes, um, you know, strikes at coffee shops. And, you know, people can't handle it. People can't handle more and more of the, of, of the impoverishing policies and, and especially in the midst of a pandemic, the brutal conditions that workers have to deal with from Amazon warehouses, uh, you know, Bernie in that clip uh, mentioned at some point the slaughterhouses and, you know, the meat industry. It's a horrible conditions for farmers out here who are dealing with terrible conditions as well. So I just don't I, I don't have time for any more of, you know, the backfilled, the smoke filled rooms with all the, the guys mostly in suits and everything and trying to wield and deal uh, when the entire working class here is suffering. And it's suffering big time. So it's a major, major issue with the labor union, uh, labor unions overall and the labor movement. And I hope that a young generation now that's radicalizing can help push the labor movement forward to where it was, you know, at its high point in the in the teens and the 20s and the 30s. Progressive era, you're basically yeah. you're saying all the ones that survived uh, Reagan. <laughs> Those are the <laughs> ones exactly that absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, with that being said, I, I you know, I do want to give a shout out to someone like Sarah Nelson, who who is a flight attendant. So she comes from the actual working trade and she was unafraid and kind of stepped out from the pack in pressuring Trump uh, when 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 he wanted to hold up the government. And so she said, you want to play this game? Let's let's play. But of course, the flight, uh, you know, the flight attendants and the airline industry have been devastated in this pandemic. And of course, they have a real pressure point right there, too. But you're you're in Canada. Lance. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I can I can say this. Why don't we look towards history and, and in U.S. history? What happened last time we were going through a great uh, rep- uh, sorry depression or recession? Um, the government uh, stepped in and created one of the largest jobs creation programs in its history. And, and that was necessary at the time to get all those millions and millions of unemployed Americans back into the workforce. The same thing could happen now. And to everyone who screams, how are we going to pay for it? You could do it the same way they paid for it back then, which was taxing the rich, 
taxing the rich was how they paid for those initial job programs. Millions and millions of unemployed Americans right now could be used for things that are very necessary, such as contact, uh, contact tracing, something that is woefully uh, understaffed, right? Those are things that will save lives. And not to mention, there's a, a huge array of things, infrastructure development, uh, fixing all the roads and other things in America that is broken. But that is something that could be done. And that would unfortunately have to be done on a government level. But uh, I mean, maybe that's a little too radical uh, to suggest, but it was it was done back in the day. I mean, we had an infrastructure uh, stimulus after 2000, the 2008 collapse, even under Obama. But, you know, again, it's like with pressure from the government workers unions, whether whichever those unions are, it all it didn't come out of nowhere. And this is what I'm like getting frustrated as if we are not pushing back, they're not going to do anything. <laughs> Like, True. Um, all right, let's get to just as before we wrap up, uh, let's let's get to this students pushback as as Christopher Herlali just just referenced. Um, Columbia University, they have a YDSA there, uh, Young Democratic Socialists. They began a t- tuition strike that is now historically large, encouraging students to withhold tuition funds until their demands are met. And these demands are specifically around. Uh, the, the administration's refusal to protect workers and students during a pandemic. We covered this a few weeks ago. We covered what was happening um, at Harvard University's campus. This is happening across the country, of course. It's not just private institutions. It's even public institutions. Uh, but I mean, Chris, let's go back to you because you mentioned that this kind of organizing is coming from below. And, and frankly, people outside of the union, which is people with privilege who come in and have money, <laughs> you answer to money um, to say, you know, we're going to withhold our tuitions when, when, of course, all these universities are crying that they, they're not getting enough money. Uh, uh, absolutely. And of course, as happen. you know, I'm a grad student right now at Dartmouth and Dartmouth is an Ivy League school that has a multi-billion dollar endowment. I mean, we're talking about more money than some uh, you know, impoverished, uh, colonized countries have, you know, in, 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 in the, in the global South. So when you look at it and you, you wonder like in the midst of a pandemic and all this stuff, you're still charging us, you know, an exorbitant amount. I think that the tuition right now with all the fees and everything over $80,000, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, I wouldn't be able to attend if I didn't have a full, you know, almost full scholarship. So for me looking now, and I, I, I got contacted by a bunch of students because they know that I was, you know, organizing and, you know, the radical that I am. And we had a we had a meeting and people started organizing, petitioning, saying we don't want to pay or the, the, the school should support us because we're suffering. Even even, for example, the people that get left out of this are the international students who are stuck here or who are stuck back home. They can't they don't have enough money. Maybe money got cut off. Maybe their families have been impacted, family members dying or losing their jobs or things like that. I am telling you, there's so many horrible stories. And what this is, is a failure of our system. It's a structural failure. And the way now that students and administration as well, faculty members are helping to organize um, around this and basically say, this is an institution that can absolutely uh, fund all of the students. It could be free tomorrow. I hope you know that these universities have enormous contracts, not only with defense contracts, which are enormous, uh, pharmaceuticals. Explain that. Explain how they have contracts. So, so, so a lot of what people don't realize is that uh, there's a model in the university system where professors have collaboration with either Department of Defense or other advanced research programs, and the, the, the university can take the patent of the development and then makes money on the patents, right? Or so there weapons? are tremendous... Uh, on patents, like, pat- like patented technology. No, 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 I, was asking, I was asking or yeah. things that are used for weaponry too. Absolutely. All that stuff. Absolutely. Wow. From weaponry to biotech, all that stuff. And so universities get huge kickbacks. Uh, and there's actually a case of a professor who's gotten like 100 plus patents, I think, in Texas, maybe Texas A&M, and basically made the university a small fortune, uh, basically because the university now claims that as their intellectual property and patents it as their own. So you have this confluence where academia is intimately linked with you know, especially a lot of these agencies and government bureaucracies. So they have a tremendous revenue stream. So when they cry to us and tell us that, oh, we're going through hard times. Bullshit. I mean, I mean I, come on, come on. You can't say that to me. You can't sell me that when the land that they're on alone is is worth millions, yes. millions I of dollars. That's the big NYU thing is they, they, of course. they bought up land all over Manhattan. <laughs> of course, or Harvard in Cambridge and Boston. Dartmouth out here. I mean, these schools are like little fiefdoms, you know, you say surf TV. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Feudalism, you know, they're little fiefdoms. And so they're little enclaves on their own and they have their own, administ- their own, they're basically their own government in the areas in which they operate. 
So I, I absolutely think that it's it's absolutely horrific. Uh, number one, that we have to pay tuition to go to school anyway. But in the midst of a pandemic, that these multi-billion dollar institutions cannot even provide for their students, or at least say no tuition during the pandemic, nothing. That's why I keep telling people, don't wait for anything to happen. Look in the mirror. You've the one, you're the one who you've been waiting for. So get out there and organize. That's that's all we can do. Lance, what's your take on this all? Uh, yeah, I don't understand the prices in the US. I can tell you this. My partner got accepted to Columbia University for environmental architecture. And uh, the same program in Canada was 10 times less the cost. So it would have been, I think, 100000 or $130,000 there, 13000 in Canada. And then my friend in Denmark was like, well, actually, in Denmark, uh, we pay you. Yeah, that's right. If you go to university in Denmark, not only is the tuition covered for, we will pay you for your food, your your housing, everything. Oh so that's that's just showing you a scale of what is possible. And, and like, you know, Denmark, it's not an impoverished nation. Denmark is not hurting in any way. So it really shows you it's, it's really a thing of organization. And if the United States is, in fact, the greatest, uh, most amazing, God fearing country that ever existed, but most importantly, the richest. Then, then why is it so bad there? Why is it such a for-profit system? I, I think maybe I'm answering my own question in real time. Because I think we have to pay $200 for our e-version of a book uh, versus the $300 the, of the physical version of the book. And that's going to get them out of this hole. Yeah. I mean, it's it's exploitative. And I, and I think what I'm more concerned about, and you have seen this kind of addressed um, from a few different lawmakers who I guess are not rooted in um, delusion at this point is what happens when you have a generation that not only is in debt, as we know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases in debt, um, but what happens when, when you have the next generation, which is not getting higher education, they're not getting quality public school education. And in some states, they're just erasing history and erasing, well, they're doing that everywhere. They're erasing science, basic stuff, you know, Christian coalition, like led, you know, uh, education in Texas, et cetera. And then, you know, we don't have uh, the programs in place for people to get technical education to be able to afford it. You have for-profit colleges preying on folks and you can't even, and now they're not going to be able to afford to go to public institutions, let alone private institutions. So we are literally establishing a, a, a caste system like we've never seen in this country, at least with, with this type of uh, democratic, you know, openness, I guess you could say, you know, ever since, since black people and women could vote. <laughs> Let's just say it from that perspective. Um, I don't know. I mean, what happens after this? Let's, that's the final question. Where do we go from here? Chris? I think we're entering a new dark ages. I really do. Because the, think about it this way. The amount of uh, the, the, the way in which we're moving is not necessarily the 1984 scenario. It's sort of like the brave new world scenario. It's the scenario where we have a technocracy, where we have you know, large conglomerates that control what information is 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 given. And then you have on the other side, a, a wealth of information that you don't know how to navigate. You know, one of the, the best things I learned in school was how to understand bias, how to understand ideology behind whatever somebody says. And that can tell you what their values and principles are, what their ethical line is. You know, if somebody starts preaching to me the, the, the beauty of the free market, I can understand, okay, they believe in this strong individualism. They're, they are beholden to capitalism versus somebody who might preach socialism. And that tells you a lot about where they're at. Now, people don't get this. We are training robots. We're training humans to be robots. We're training them. Everybody's talking about technical education. Whereas I'm still advocating for the liberal arts because I want people 100%. to know philosophy. Yes. I want people to know art. I want people to know culture. I want people to be able to engage with the world with light. And I don't know, it sounds hippy dippy, but it actually is very <laughs> serious. It's like, how can you look at the world around you and, and just see it as like these mechanical gears and somehow I'm pulling the lever. It goes back to like the Charlie Chaplin movies, you know, like, you know, and you just look at it and you're like, this is horrible. This is horrible. Like, and I think the education system is, is, is going and going uh, way, way worse because we are, we're literally making it all about tests. We're making it all about, we're not thinking, we're not teaching people critical thinking as you know, the great George Carlin or, used to say. Or history, which is or, none of that stuff more because that's also right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not teaching and we're not teaching people the right history, you know, like the, the actual history. We're teaching people the myths and the mythologies that help to reinforce, you know, U.S. imperialism and hegemony and sort of the, the manifest destiny. Absolutely. Of course. Without a doubt. And that's also in Canada, too. I know that you're dealing with it up there as well. And there's a big reckoning going on with the First Nations and with with all the stuff there. It's all in, in these countries, in, in especially what we would consider to be like a Western Europe. And then, of course, like Australia, New Zealand, you know, all that stuff, us, Canada, we have a reckoning to do because these are countries that kind of 
project themselves as being somehow uh, enlightened nations, as you were saying before. You know, it, it, somehow they're 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 God fearing. They 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 are they are God's gift to Earth, but they're not. They're not. In fact, this pandemic and the current crisis has revealed their absolute barbarity in comparison with other countries that we demonize, like China. Everybody's out there. I, I see videos from my friends. Everybody's going by on daily life in China. Why? They were able to close everything up. They were able to lock down everything and people obeyed. And now everything's open again and kids are back in universities and they're about to have a Chinese New Year coming up in two months. And everyone's going to be going home and traveling. So for me, I just don't understand it. I don't understand how we are in this time period, how education is getting worse. But the thing is, we do understand it. As progressives, we know where it's coming from. The thing is to enlighten and to help raise the class consciousness of everybody else out there for them to realize that it's not the immigrant, it's not the poor black person or the quote unquote welfare queen in the language of Ronald Reagan and this kind of stuff. No, it's the ruling class on both sides of the aisle who are doing this to ourselves. You know, we're doing it to ourselves. My Lance, let's let's because I do think that there's a there, there's like a line, a little bit of a line. Clearly, all of the countries that you mentioned are European founded countries, white European, I'll, I'll say. Um, whether it's actual Europe or or uh, Australia, New Zealand, the U.S., Canada, we I don't have to describe all this. Um, but moving forward, Lance, I mean, we have uh, we have some some folks on who come from from the EU who live there right now who talk about how you know just basic necessity, even an austerity driven Germany, they're receiving not just money but enough money so their kids can have like ch- chess class still. I mean, there's just a, a completely different understanding and, and and maybe it's because of the roots of slavery that have built this country, a different respect for their people. Maybe it's just human rights. I don't know. I mean, well, I, I can't- let me, let me say this since we're just focusing on Eurocentric countries. We can also look at countries like Vietnam, for example, that have done exceptionally well when it comes to COVID. And they've done it for a fraction of the cost that the United States did. They did it by um, setting up a lot of free stations for people, cleaning stations everywhere, doing amazing contra- uh, contact tracing, the which of which should be the envy of other countries. They were able to get their numbers down to practically nothing at the same time while it was exploding in the United States. And this is supposed to be an evil, again, communist country that's going to destroy us all, right? Um, it doesn't have to be simply Western nations or simply Scandinavian nations. Oh, and before I forget this, Brave New World had better drugs than 1984. That was that was one point I wanted to bring up. <laughs> Comparing these two points. Um, but no, honestly, the if, if this is if this is to be the final point, I completely agree with what uh, you know everyone's been saying. At the end of the day, all the pandemic did was kind of lift a rock up to show the way the world actually works. And everyone keeps talking about, well, we have to get back to the good old days. We have to go back to before this, right? I don't think there is a going back. I, I hope. This has waken, like, awoken most people to the fact that, yes, um, disproportionately Black people, Indigenous people, poor people, old people, all are the ones dying. And the reason for that is completely financial, right? If you just look down all the core mobilities, all the problems they have, all the poverty they have, the fact that most of them are frontline workers, that's the reason that they are dying at much higher rates than the rest of the world. 100%. Because we've commodified 100%. all of our people the entire country. It's not only- Are you people, ready to so. build back better? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> what is that On even that mean? note. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right, guys. <laughs> Hashtag build back better. I thought we hated, I thought we hated slogans. I'm so confused. Obama, you're confusing me. <laughs> I love slogans. Peace, land, bread. That's where I'm at. Peace, land, oh, that's good. At least that's that represents good. something. <laughs> All right. uh, Lance, from the Surf's TV, Christopher Halali, straight out of Vermont, uh, just south of Canada. There you go. We got a we got a very northern perspective right now. <laughs> um, see you guys very soon. Be well, and uh, you know it's been a great show. I really I, thanks for sticking around a little bit extra time. Hopefully, we can send that out to our patrons so they get a little bit of extra. But go check out their work. Uh, we'll put all their information in the bio and. Uh, as we close it out, I just want to give some shout outs to everybody who's been in the chat. I know Professor Harvey K has been mixing it up in the chat. Shout out to our moderators. I think we've got some stuff that I have to do some shout outs where you guys are free to leave while I do the, the end of the show <laughs> shout outs if you need to. Thank you for everything. Oh. One, one last thing before I go, uh, do you want to promote yourselves? Because I'm streaming right now live too. There's like 800 <laughs> oh, yes. people watching. So so say hello. Give, give your socials and all that. Yeah. You go go ahead, no, Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I'm... I'm- I'm, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We're talking over, we can't hear each other because it's Zoom. This is the problem with this stuff. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Christopher Halali. You can find me at Chris Halali. No, Miki, to you. 
<laughs> I love how Chris Halali says my name perfectly because he's Greek. Uh, right. I'm, Nomi- <laughs> I'm Nomiki Konst and I am the host of The Nomiki Show. Check me out at youtube.com slash The Nomiki Show and of course, patreon.com slash The Nomiki Show if you are generous and want to indoctrinate, as I'm saying, this is the indoctrination program. You bring in the normie dems and then you start to have the Christopher Halalis and the surfs on and then they're like, whoa, my brain is like, whoa. <laughs> I do have to say it was awesome to have Salvador Tio on. It was really amazing. And you, and I, I hope you continue to have those kind of people on because they are amazing. We need to have global South perspectives. We need to have, you know, sort of the anti-imperialist, anti-colonial perspective. So I'm really, really happy to have listened to that. I'm glad that you did because Salvador is um, just an amazing activist. And when I was doing work on the island, he, I mean... Uh, he informed everything uh, that I went into when covering just the reaction and the response or non-response to Hurricane Maria. Uh, mm-hmm. So definitely. We'll be doing more of those. We had something out on Friday. If you guys want to go back and look, we had an amazing interview um, over the the murder of Berta Casares. Uh, there's a new book about that murder. Check that out on Friday. It was an awesome, awesome interview. So we'll do more of that in the coming awesome. weeks to keep us sane. <laughs> <laughs> well, All thanks right. so much, I'll everyone. Absolute out. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, And thank you to Al Walski. Uh, Al Walski, thanks for the the love because I appreciate your tireless efforts to bring us endless truth. That is a tongue twister. Appreciate you, Al. And Patrick Emmerich, great panel today. I really enjoy when Chris is on. So do we. Prairie Fire Kowalski from Nebraska uh, says, I'm spreading fertilizer for the co-op across nine countries. Wow. And we have infrastructure that was built because of the New Deal still paying us dividends. Wow. That's a big, that's actually a great slogan. Like this, it's not just about the immediate future. Big thank you to M. Toussaint filling in for MIDI doctors today and working the algorithms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our moderator token for keeping the chat room troll free. All right, everybody. We will see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Uh, check us out here at youtube.com slash the Nomi show and at patreon.com slash the Nomi show. Thanks to everybody and take care. Be well. <laughs>